This podcast contains adult themes and language, and some of the things that we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. In this podcast, we discuss sexual assault, torture, race, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Fruit Loops, episode 182. Bienvenidos, bitches, and <laughs> buiti benafi, and thank you for listening. Fruit Loops <laughs> is a podcast about true crimes committed by people of color and the victims that we don't hear or know much about. Contrary to popular belief, not all serial killers are straight, cisgendered, white, males, white what? dudes. No, you know, would you believe it, girls? There are many well-documented cases of serial killers of color and Fruit Loops is a podcast all about them. We take deep dives into the fascinating lives and crimes of serial killers and true crimes committed by people of color and the victims that the media and entertainment come and leave out because you're not going to believe this. Hold on to your butts. The news is racist. Allegedly. <laughs> and we are Wendy and Beth. She's Wendy, a Black Latinx woman. And I'm Beth. And I just happen to be white. That's right. She's just my less melanated friend. And she's one <laughs> of the good ones. <laughs> We're not journalists, investigators, or psychologists. Just a couple of gals interested in true crime. Also, the opinions expressed in this podcast are just that, our opinions. Please send any questions or comments to fruitloopspod at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 602-935-6294. And we may feature it on a future episode. Also, Beth told me to shut up before. I <laughs> so did I'm not. not just kidding. I did not. <laughs> but I, I never. I would sec- never. Any second I can to extend it. <laughs> extend, I will. So also, you should know our website is fruitloopspod.com and we use Fruit Loops Pod for all our social media, including TikTok. And our footnotes for each episode can be found on our website. Plus, check it out for the different ways you can support the show and become a Fruit Loops patron. Yeah. So, who are we talking about today, girl? Well, today we're talking about Marcus Delon Wesson, a black man convicted of nine counts of first degree murder and 14 sex crimes, mm. including the rape and molestation of his underage daughters. And nieces. And nieces, yes. And this subject was suggested to us by our fruities, Brittany, Laura, and Trinai. Yes, this one is a bear. And it's been on our list for a long time. <laughs> yeah, we've been putting it off because it's, it's a tough one. So it's a yeah, yeah. Buckle your seat, Bill. Yeah, buckle up. Um, so before we get into it, uh, how you doing? I'm doing good. I just wanted to say to our fruities, mm-hmm. Merry Christmas, Happy mm-hmm. Hanukkah, mm-hmm. Happy Kwanzaa, mm-hmm. Happy Holidays, Happy yes. all the things. <laughs> yes, yes, yay, jingle jangle. Uh, <laughs> let's. <laughs> Um, I will also say about this episode, I first found out about it when we were at CrimeCon and we yeah. met Alicia, whose book Alicia. was we, yeah. Alicia, yeah, we heavily um, used as a source for this episode. So just shout out to her um, yes. before we get into it. So uh, now it's time for listener letters. Thank you. What is in that bag, Beth? Well, would you believe it? It's Christmas and they handed me an empty fucking bag. <laughs> oh my, not even a reindeer turd? No. Nope, oh my not, God, how dare well, they? At least, at least there's not a reindeer turd. Okay. All right, oh, let's okay. look on the bright oh, you side. Did, you didn't want a reindeer turd. Okay, no, just no. me. That's, it's cool. Uh, it's cool. Okay, well, uh, I will say uh, shout out to everyone who had us in their Spotify wrapped for 2022 yeah. and shared it with us. We appreciate you rock, rocking with us. All 
all year round. And so we are really, really grateful for y'all listening. So thank yeah, you thank for being you. here with us. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to get into the story when we come back. The end of the year is approaching and it feels like there is so much pressure to put off fun until you quote unquote deserve it. You know what? We already do enough every single day. We've earned all the joy exactly when we want it. That's right. We've already earned some fun. So let's have it. What do we want? Joy and best fiends. <laughs> when do we want it? Now. And <laughs> well, let me tell you, fun normally gets pushed to the bottom of our to-do list. And we yeah. often wait for quote unquote free time to do things that make us smile. And we are here to tell you that you can add some joy to your daily routine with best fiends, the puzzle adventure game you won't be able to put down. With best fiends, it's so easy to pick up and play a few levels anytime. It feels so good to beat a level or get in the zone. Yeah. You know, when I was at the dentist the other day in the waiting room for an extended amount of time and they had no Wi-Fi, but it was all right because I had Best Fiends. Woo. And now I'm on level 755, baby. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Best Fiends is a free-to-download mobile puzzle game with thousands of exciting new levels for new adventures and challenges every time you play. There are dozens of unique fiends to collect and with offline play, you'll never be stranded without fun, even if you lose your internet connection. Brand new events and challenges pop up all year round, so you've always got a chance to earn exclusive in-game items, characters, and rewards. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Hello there. We are Wendy and Beth from the podcast Fruit Loops Serial Killers of Color. And we'd like to tell you about a podcast on the Evergreen Network called Crime Capsule. Join host Benjamin Morris as he focuses on exclusive interviews with authors who are experts on their regions, topics, and cases, often with special insight. Crime Capsule has a unique partnership with Arcadia History Press. And Arcadia History Press has a strong true crime list Ooh. featuring cases from everywhere, as well as unsolved and cold cases with a geographic focus covering the entire United States. Nice. Mm. And they maintain a good balance between historical and contemporary cases, so you are never at a loss in a given region for something new to explore. Crime Capsule travels the country looking for the local, the weird, and the untold and celebrates local authors. Episodes of Crime Capsule explore not just the case or crime itself, but also questions of research, writing, and historical methods involved in the investigation. That sounds fascinating. Oh, yeah. Crime Capsule often takes specific themes to explore over a period of several weeks like Great Escapes, Black History Month, Paranormal, all kinds of stuff for listeners who want to take a deep dive into a topic. Oh yes, exciting. And if you love podcasts about history and crime like me and me and Beth, <laughs> you're going to love Crime Capsule. Check it out everywhere you listen to podcasts, including this one right now. You can also pick up the related books at ArcadiaPublishing.com or the new Crime Capsule Bookshop page, which supports Ooh. indie booksellers. Wow. And that's at bookshop.org slash show slash crime dash capsule. Beth, remind us, who is our subject today? Well, what started out as a routine custody dispute at a house in Fresno, California, escalated into the worst mass murder in Fresno's history when Marcus Delon Wesson murdered nine people, one adult and eight children. All of his victims were his own children, fathered by incestuous relationships with his daughters and nieces, as well as the children by his wife. <clears throat> Horrifying. Uh, yeah. So now let's just move into the stats. No need for hip hop air horns on this one. Yeah. Uh, so Marcus Delon Wesson, uh, a.k.a. the Vampire King. And his victims, we'd like to say rest in power to the beautiful souls lost and peace, power and love to those left in the wake of this senseless tragedy. Um, the victims are Sabrina April Wesson, who was 25. Lisi, Brianni Kina Wesson, 17. Illabel Carey Wesson, 8. Aviv Dominique Wesson, 7. Jonathan St. Charles Wesson, 7. Ethan St. Laurent Wesson, 4. Sedona Vadra Wesson, 4. Two, Marche St. Christopher Wesson, two, and Jeva St. Vlandon's Respry Wesson was one years old. So now it's time to get into the setting. Take us there, Beth. Oh, I can't wait. Fresno. Woo. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> 
As Wendy said, the setting is Fresno, located in the San Joaquin Valley in Central California. The valley is one of the world's most productive agricultural regions. It is also the traditional homelands of the Yokuts and Mono peoples. According to 2018 data from the U.S. Census Bureau, over half of West Fresno lives below the poverty line, while the rest of Fresno hovers around 27 percent. West Fresno residents earn about half the median salary of the rest of Fresno. Fewer residents graduate high school or own homes. And on average, they live about 20 years less than the oh. residents in wealthier parts of the city, according mm. to a 2012 Fresno State study. That's 20 years. That's, a, wow. that's incredible. Yeah. Uh, wow. And not only is it uh, shocking, but mm -hmm. it's not by accident. Oh, boy. Unrelenting disinvestment, neglect, and a lack of representation have held back generations of black and brown residents. That's uh, staggering. I don't yeah. know what else to say. From Fresno's inception in the 1800s, white homesteaders positioned the city's landfill on the west side of the railroad tracks. Factories, meatpacking, houses, and slaughterhouses were all placed in West Fresno. White residents then refused to lease, rent, or sell property east of the tracks to the Chinese immigrants who built them. Throughout the 20th century, the city cornered Mexican, Japanese, Armenian, and Italian immigrants, and eventually Black residents, into the West Side. Mm. Many immigrants moved north, but Black residents were denied the opportunity to live anywhere else through redlining. Now, let's talk about the Seventh-day Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is a Protestant Christian denomination that was founded in the 1860s in the U.S. Adventists share most of their beliefs with the mainstream Christian churches, but also some other beliefs of their own. The name Seventh-day Adventist is based on the church's observance of the biblical Sabbath on Saturday as the seventh day of the week. The Saturday Sabbath brought the Seventh-day Adventists into conflict with both commercial interests and other Christians because they wouldn't work on Saturday and treat Sunday as the Sabbath. And they don't celebrate holidays, right? Um, that was I'm... my understanding. And I only bring that up because there is a Black conspiracy <laughs> theory <laughs> that Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate, they don't celebrate Christmas. But the reason why um, Black people convert to this religion is so they don't have to buy Christmas presents so, for all of those kids. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if there's any truth to that. <laughs> but I just thought, I mean, I, I thought about this the whole time I was researching this case. <laughs> So That's I crazy. Do, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, a, and you know, I love conspiracies. So that's where my head went. Like they had a lot of kids. And so if they yeah, were, that's a, lot of, Adventist, that's a lot of presents and they didn't celebrate Christmas, they wouldn't have to buy one present for anybody. Saving yeah. savings, the savings. Yeah, anyway, so <laughs> I, I just Googled it and it looks like they do not celebrate Christmas, but um, at least one source I read said that they would, the Wesson family at least, they would mm -hmm. do 12 days of Christmas where oh. they would um, do something special for 12 uh -huh. days before Christmas. Okay. And, but it was like having a, a special dinner or something like that. It wasn't Okay, presents. not like opening presents. No, no. Okay. So, well, I mean, all these conspiracies I'm into seem to have validation somewhere. And somewhere, yeah. Check, that box is checked. So ad <laughs> Adv Adventists do not believe that people go to heaven or hell when they die. They believe that the dead remain unconscious until the second coming of Christ or advent of Jesus, which they believe is imminent. On that day, the righteous dead will be resurrected and taken with him to heaven together with the righteous living. This will be followed by a period of a thousand years called the millennium, during which the earth will be taken over by Satan and his helpers. After the millennium, Christ with his saints will return to earth. The unrighteous dead will be resurrected, then destroyed by fire along oh. with Satan and his helpers, leaving behind a universe without sin or sinners. For the rest of time, God and humanity will live together in a paradise. And I will just, I just want to say that for people who have these beliefs, like they really they really believe it. It's not mm -hmm. an act. It's not, you know, so and I understand having these beliefs, but I also appreciate not having it forced on me. Amen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the Adventist lifestyle is simple. 
They're clothing conservative, although still modern. They wear tasteful, conservative, and sensible styles that are common during any particular period, but chosen for their durability and practicality. Profuse ornamentation and gaudy display are unacceptable. No peacocks. No peacocks? Oh, no! (laughs) Personal health is specifically mentioned in Adventist doctrine, which tells the followers to regard their bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit. They link spiritual and physical health together, believing that what is good for the body is good for the soul, and vice versa. And they see it as a religious duty to live healthy lives. And we'll learn that Marcus Wesson did not didn't practice follow that. any of this yeah. stuff. <laughs> So uh, one way Adventists keep healthy is by eating a healthy diet, following the food rules laid down by Leviticus 11. They recommend a vegetarian diet. Meat is permitted, but only following the biblical commandments on clean and unclean food. In 1894, Seventh-day Adventist John Harvey Kellogg, oh boy, invented (laughs) Kellogg cornflakes. Is it the guy who invented cornflakes because he thought kids were masturbating too much? Yeah. Anyway, invented cornflakes as a healthy replacement for the heavy breakfast foods that were eaten at the time. Adventists live modest lives with a strict code of ethics. Among the church's co-founders was Ellen G. White, whose extensive writings are still held in high regard by the church. She told her Seventh-day Adventist flock that they must abstain not only from eating meat, but also from using tobacco or consuming coffee, tea, and of course, alcohol. Mm, Of course. So she warned against indulging in greasy, fried foods, spicy condiments, and pickled foods, overeating and using drugs of any kind. (laughs) She also warned against wearing binding corsets, wigs, or tight dresses. Such evils, she taught, (laughs) led to the morally and physically destructive self-vice of masturbation. Oh, and no. excessive sexual intercourse. Uh-oh. Speaking of sex, sex outside of marriage was forbidden. Adultery, homosexual and lesbian practices, sexual abuse within marriage, incest and sexual abuse of children are banned. Interesting when we get into the story. Yep. Uh, so now we're going to get into Marcus Delon Wesson's early life. So Marcus Delon Wesson was born on August 22nd in 1946 in Kansas to Benjamin and Carrie. His father was a violent and abusive alcoholic. His mother was a Seventh-day Adventist and religious fanatic. It's been alleged that Wesson's father molested him and his siblings. Later on the witness stand, Wesson's sister didn't confirm this, but she did state that when their father was drinking, he was much more inclined to hug and kiss them. The children knew the best best way to avoid unwanted physical affection when their father was drunk was to hide until he sobered up. And a childhood friend of Wesson's testified that Benjamin had once offered to pay him $50 in exchange for oral sex. Wesson's father would eventually run off with a male nephew whom he was having an affair with. Marcus was a quiet child, often fading into the background. But he did love to pretend to be a preacher leading his flock, where he could be the center of attention. He also loved trains and animals. Oh, well, normal little boy stuff. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So Marcus had a crew cut, and at school he wore dress pants and button-up shirts with a tie. To school, which made yep. him the focus on purpose, on purpose, <laughs> the focus of bullies. Um, but he never allowed himself to be pressured by classmates to try drugs or alcohol. He was an obedient son. He was, however, not a good student and never graduated from high school. He had almost enough credits and was allowed to participate in his class's graduation exercises. He was supposed to make up the credits, but he never did. And he never received his diploma. A news story gets shared by a friend on social media, or you catch a tweet that really makes your blood boil. But how do you separate fact from fiction? That's the premise behind Disinformation, a 10-part series from Evergreen Podcasts and Emergent Risk International coming this fall. Tune in to Disinformation wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't believe everything you read. 
So now we are going to get into the timeline. So Wesson joined the army during the Vietnam conflict and became an ambulance driver. Discharged in 1968, he then took up with a married woman named Rosemary Maitorena, or Solorio, which may be her married name. I saw it, her named with both names, so I'm assuming Maitorena was mm-hmm. her maiden name. Oh, because I think okay. one of her children was also named Rosemary and used the last name Solorio. Right. Right. I'm glad you said that because Rosemary's name does come up later on in the story. And they're not referring to this woman. This one. So thank you for that distinction. You're welcome. Um, So (laughs) she (laughs) was 13 years older than Wesson. And Rosemary already had a lot of children of her own. Something like eight or nine kids. One source I consulted said 10. So. Wow. So yeah. a lot of kids. A anyway. lot of kids. Yeah. She was at the time in a vulnerable position. Her husband had left her and she was trying to raise her children on her own, but had difficulty keeping them in order. <laughs> of course, oh, there's yeah. too many. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. They were basically just running wild. Mm-hmm. Wesson offered help in disciplining them. And as a younger man, just out of the army, she was smitten. <laughs> I mean, I can't blame her. Yeah. Um, so Wesson worked briefly at a bank. At first, he seemed to enjoy wearing a suit and heading off to work, but he soon became disillusioned. He said he was disgusted by what he felt was an obsession with money, both by people who worked in the bank and the clients. Rosemary and Wesson had one son whom they named Adair. But soon Wesson was spending an inordinate amount of time with Rosemary's eight-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. Wesson's interest in Elizabeth soon became physical, and she became Wesson's first victim. When Elizabeth was nine, Wesson held a mock wedding ceremony with her. She thought they were just playing, but afterwards he told her it was real and that they were really married. But it was a secret and not to tell anyone. Red flag. Yeah. From that point on, he referred to her as his wife. Elizabeth said Wesson told her that he owned her and he threatened to kill her if she ever left him. She was nine. Can you imagine? Nine years old. No. Yeah. No, I can't. That's no. a year older than my grandson. Oh, fuck. And he's no. a baby. Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, my God. That yeah. breaks my heart when you think when you think of in think of it in the context in of the children of, in your life yeah. that you know yeah. and yep. their mentality and actions. Just yeah. It's awful. Yeah. They did become legally married eventually when Elizabeth was 15 and five months pregnant. You might be asking, where was Rosemary in all this? Well, Mm. we don't really know. It seems she was unaware of the mock marriage and, you know, him calling her his wife and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But when Elizabeth became pregnant... Rosemary signed off on her legal marriage to Wesson because Mm. they had to get her permission. Okay. Given Wesson's later behavior, I don't think it's a stretch to imagine that Rosemary was also abused and manipulated by Wesson. Couldn't agree more. By the age of 26, Elizabeth Wesson had given birth 11 times. Wesson and Elizabeth would have a total of 10 children together, with one stillbirth and one son dying from meningitis as an infant. The nine remaining children's names are Elizabeth, a.k.a. Lisi, Serafino, a.k.a. Fino, Gypsy, Marcus Jr., Al May, Sabrina, Kiana, Adrian, and Dorian. Wesson also took in a number of Elizabeth's nieces and nephews who had been neglected by their mother, Elizabeth's sister, also named Rosemary, who was battling a serious drug addiction at the time. To say that the children's living circumstances were horrific is an understatement. Wesson would go on to quote, unquote, Mary and have children with three of his nieces, Ruby, Ortiz, Rosa, and Sofina, sometimes called Sofia. These marriages were in addition to those with two of his own daughters, Kiani and Sabrina. The pattern that began with Elizabeth, the interruption of education and isolation, was a pattern repeated with Wesson's own children and the nieces and nephews that he had taken in. Although the family almost always lived together, they were isolated from the rest of the world. Wesson was a large man who was very tall and about 300 pounds. He ate fast food and cookies while the kids ate pinto beans or rummaged in dumpsters for food. He was the man of the house, and his word was law. Wesson controlled his children through his own interpretation and version of the Bible. Harsh beatings, sex, isolation, and rejection, like not talking to them for days. Right, right. Yeah. And they couldn't talk to each other in some cases. 
Mm -hmm. Wesson hated the outside world, saying it was, quote, out to get God's people and destroy them, unquote. He also spoke often of the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. He told his family that their only chance of salvation was through him. The children were homeschooled, and that is a term used loosely. Yeah. They received very little actual education aside from basic reading, writing, and arithmetic. They also were not allowed toys. The few toys they were given to them by Elizabeth's family, Wesson threw away. The children were not taken regularly to the pediatrician for wellness visits. They didn't go to public school, where a concerned teacher might have noticed signs of abuse. They were intentionally kept segregated from the outside world by their father. Yeah, red flag abuse. Abuse, abuse, abuse is going yeah. off. But if, yeah. if they're not exposed to the outside world, who's going to see it and report it? Yeah. And a lot of people didn't even know that there were as many kids as there were. They didn't see them. Right. And also, it sh- it <laughs> Culture Corner, uh, th- these are black children and Wesson is black, but... Um, Black children are more invisible. Black and brown children are more invisible than other kids. And so that I think also might have contributed to people yeah. saying, not my business. No, yeah. I don't know anything. So don't care. Mm-hmm. Don't care. Thank you. So Wesson spent hours preaching his own beliefs to his children. Over the years, Wesson collected a myriad of bizarre beliefs. Bizarre, is also an understatement. <laughs> and welded them together to create his own religion, which he then imposed upon his growing family. He wrote his own version of the Bible, by hand, by the way, in which he claimed that Jesus was a vampire. Uh, That's a new one. (laughs) And then proclaimed himself to be, at times, Jesus Christ. Jesus, what are you doing here? And at other times, God. (laughs) His Bible studies and prayer sessions would last for hours. His children later told ABC News that they didn't realize what a hellish situation they were living in because they were born into it and had no outside influences to teach them otherwise. Very important point because his yeah. this case is often referred to as a cult and yeah. cults are usually adults choosing to choosing join something. To join, yeah. And these children these did kids not were have born a choice. Into it. Exactly. Yeah. In 1993 Wesson became obsessed with what was happening in Waco, Texas with the Branch Davidians, David Koresh, a man after Wesson's own heart, a leader <laughs> of the Branch Davidians had taken several quote-unquote spiritual wives, several of whom were teenagers, intending to create a lineage of children who he believed would eventually rule the world. The whole world? Like all 360 degrees of this sphere we live on? Okay, David (laughs) Koresh. But the authorities weren't concerned about that. Rather, they only became concerned when Koresh launched a retail gun business. Early in 1993, ATF agents in Texas attempted to serve a search warrant for Koresh's Mount Carmel complex. It turned into a gunfight, then a standoff. By the way, did you watch this on TV? Yeah, I, I only watched. I only watched the movie with John Linguizambo as one of the FBI agents. Ah, um, okay. I don't I know saw, if I, I saw the movie or not, but I, I remember recall. when this happened. Really? Okay, yeah. okay. All right. Just trying to bring us into the scene, all right? Yes. So for 51 days, federal agents camped outside the compound. This was covered in the news daily. And according to family members, Wesson had the TV on all the time to follow what was happening. Finally, agents launched an assault and initiated a tear gas attack in an attempt to force the Branch Davidians out of the ranch. Shortly thereafter, the complex became engulfed in flames. The fire resulted in the deaths of 76 Branch Davidians, 76. Wow. including 25 children, oh my two God. pregnant women, and David Koresh. You know, I have a lot of thoughts about yeah. the government coming in and doing that. It seems... How they, yeah, it was very, uh, it was condemned. Yeah. Yeah. How they yeah, handled that's a it. Good, that's a good word for it. Um, yeah. And uh, everybody involved should go to hell. Anyway, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I mean that's a lot of, that's a lot of people because lot of people. they were because they were dealing in guns yeah. um there there I could think of a million there had to other have ways been a, a to much resolve better that. way to handle yeah, that yeah exactly 
So um, Wesson saw Koresh as a man waging war against the federal government to protect his constitutional rights regarding freedom of religion and the right to live and raise his family as he saw fit. He believed that Koresh's idea of having as many children as possible was something ordained by God. According to Wesson, their way of life was also ordained by God. Wesson believed that at the time of the second coming of Christ, the more children you could turn over to God, the greater your eternal reward. Therefore, Wesson wanted to have as many children as he could, both with his own daughters and nieces. He also told his children that if the government ever threatened the family, they were to follow a murder-suicide plan that he'd formulated. The quote-unquote strongest soldier was to kill everyone else and then themselves. Wesson himself was left out of the plan. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't going to die. <laughs> what? That doesn't yeah. seem right. But nobody could question him. And we'll right. learn throughout the story that nobody in his house was able to question whatever nope. he said. Whatever he said was was the was law. law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wesson did not have a job because he adhered to the belief that the head of the household did not work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Therefore, the large family, which at the end consisted of 24 people, subsisted on welfare and food stamps and moved often. Living arrangements varied frequently, including a shack without running water and electricity, a tugboat, and even an army tent in the woods. But they were all together. So yeah. There was an investigation by CPS in 1978 when Dorian, one of the much older children, was three years old. I think he's the oldest. Yes. And uh, so he sustained a wound on his left knee after Wesson hit him with a cake slicer he had been using to get knots out of Dorian's hair. The wound got infected and they sought treatment at the emergency room. CPS did an investigation and was charmed or manipulated by Wesson. We don't know which. And uh, eventually closed the case. As the children got older, Wesson forced his daughters to get jobs working minimum wage in fast food restaurants. The girls had no social life. Wesson also controlled what the girls wore, making them wear long dresses and long sleeves, perhaps because he wanted them to dress modestly or... Maybe it was to hide bruises. None of the women in the family were immune to Wesson's incestuous physical sexual abuse. He believed it was his job to train them to perform acts that would be pleasing to their future husbands, calling it, quote unquote, loving. Ugh. Yeah, no, I made Ugh. a face. This is yeah. an audio medium, but my face is extremely <laughs> disgusted. <laughs> Most of his daughters did not know that there was anything wrong with this. Kiani later admitted that when Wesson started his loving when she was eight, she thought it was okay. The nieces, however, who had spent some time in the outside world, knew it wasn't right. And Gypsy said that when it happened to her, she felt it was wrong. <sighs> That's a lot. Yeah. As the girls grew older, he became concerned about other men in the house being attracted to them. So he forced the boys and the girls to live separately and forbade them to talk to each other. Eventually, he kicked the boys out of the house saying, quote, get a life and find your own woman as God has commanded. Hallelujah. <laughs> unquote. He's, he said it kind of like that. Yeah. 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 But he did write it down. I'm pretty sure he wrote it down in some sort of 14 page <laughs> manifesto. Yeah. yeah. Wesson's control was so strong that even when some were allowed to leave the house and get jobs, nobody said anything, not to the police or even to anyone they worked with. The male children who had been forced to leave still had to send a portion of their paychecks home. Once the girls showed signs of pregnancy, he would tell the boys and Elizabeth that they were artificially inseminated, which as somebody who has undergone fertility treatments, there's a lot involved That's, in yeah. doing that. And, and it's it is really expensive. Super expensive. <laughs> <laughs> they accepted this and learned not to ask questions again because they were not exposed to the outside world. And they weren't allowed to ask questions. Right. So Elizabeth was not allowed to talk to her daughters anyway, at least not anything more than casual conversations, which can you imagine? No, not you're able to talk not to being your daughters able to, about or not being on? able to talk to your mom. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Awful. In addition to the sexual and psychological abuse, there were also physical beatings. The children often received a 30-day punishment, which involved 21 hits on your person, 
one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one before you went to bed for 30 days straight. The children were expected to remind their father to punish them. And if they did not, the punishment was extended. Serafino, a.k.a. Fino, recalled being beaten with a cable wire and a baseball bat wrapped in duct tape every day for 30 days for sneaking a spoonful of peanut butter. I will never have a spoonful of peanut butter again and without think thinking of it of the Fino. same way. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No, same. Same. I don't know why, but that just really sticks out to me. I had some peanut butter today and I thought about (laughs) Fino. It's it's such a benign thing that we take for granted so often. Peanut butter. Um, And then I also think of when, you know, when I was a child, my dad would say, I'm going to beat your behind when I get home. And I remember the same fear, the anxiety of I'm going to get an ass beating later. And I hope my dad forgets, but he probably won't because I was really bad. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And just just that uh, just the anticipation of waiting for that beating. um, Yeah. Awful. So sometimes worse than the actual beating. Yeah, sometimes, but yeah. I mean, for the it doesn't compare to not, what this not kid's in this case. Yeah, absolutely this, theirs, not. Theirs was absolutely terrible. Not. Oh my yeah. god, I can't even imagine. In her own way, Elizabeth did what she could to protect the children. She did accept Wesson's form of discipline because you know he was who he was, and right. Right. he also would continually remind her of how out of control her siblings had been and how they had turned out. Many had addiction issues, and Elizabeth didn't want that. For for her kids. Uh-huh. Elizabeth would intervene when he went too far, begging mm. him to stop before he killed someone. But she always suffered consequences. The children were forced to bow before Wesson and call him master. Wesson demanded that the family treat him like a king. They were ordered to scratch his armpits. You know, Ugh, gross. Disgusting. And care for his locks. And by the way, we don't say dreadlocks because it's racist. But just so you, the listener, understand what we're referring to. And also, locks take a lot of care to maintain. Um, yeah. And and Wesson's locks were famously very, very long. And so yeah. they required a lot of care. Kiani kept a diary. In it, she described family life that included movie nights on Fridays and ugly face contests where each member of the family would try to make the ugliest, funniest face. And that, that's something else that um, Wesson would do. Like, he had all these rules and these punishments and austerity but then he would take them all out for ice cream yeah and they would just love it yeah and they would have these fun times it made treat yeah yeah these treats and it just Mm -hmm. made them so happy and Mm -hmm. that's part of an abuser's toolkit yeah i'm glad you said that that is yeah you're right this is uh abuse 101. <laughs> yes, it uh, is. Mm-hmm. Kiani also noted things in her diary like, Daddy was sweet today, which may have been code for Wesson molesting her. Wesson's family continued to grow. Wesson was obsessed with the idea of vampires, and he was on that Herschel Walker nonsense. <laughs> and uh, he encouraged his children to wear dark clothing. And um, I read that he would put baby powder, they would put baby powder on their faces and wear bright red lipstick to sort of um, continue Look the more like vampires. goth or vampire yeah. look. Yeah. Wesson's niece, Sophina, gave birth to a son she named Jonathan, who was fathered by Wesson. While Jonathan was a newborn, a newborn. Mm-hmm. Wesson told her to spank the child until he went quiet. If that didn't work, Wesson would step in. Sophina could no longer tolerate the abuse and she wanted to leave. She was working with a catering company and she'd met a man that she was interested in. Wesson encouraged the girls to spy on each other as a way to control them. And he found out about Safina's love interest. An affair was unforgivable in his eyes. During a car ride, Wesson interrogated Safina and got her to admit to her quote unquote extramarital affair. Okay. While driving, Wesson stabbed Sophina in the chest and told her he hoped that she was ready to meet God. Oh my God. Yeah. She pleaded with him and said she wanted to live. The two went home that night. No medical attention. No doctor. Yeah. No nothing. No. Nope. And Wesson told Safina she could leave as long as her son Jonathan stayed with the family. Um, and so he used the children as pawns. As yeah. pawns, exactly. And he did the same to Elizabeth. So this is yeah. not something new in terms of his playbook. Right. So she left. 
leaving Jonathan behind. Wesson's niece Ruby also ran away, leaving behind her son Aviv. Wesson's daughter Gypsy, who somehow always knew there was something wrong with the way that the family lived, and that her dad was full of shit. (laughs) (laughs) I love you, Gypsy! (laughs) She escaped at the age of 19 with absolutely nothing but the clothes on her back. She Mm. still does not know how she gathered the fortitude to do it. She was terrified of her father. I think that just speaks to the human spirit and the human... We all want to survive, right? Yeah. And no matter what the circumstances if that voice inside of us is strong enough, we will do whatever it takes in spite of whatever is in front of us. And shout out to Gypsy for doing the thing. Yeah. Around the year 2000, just before Y2K, remember when we all thought the world was going to (laughs) end? When uh, And a lot of people thought this. uh, And Wesson, his preaching became more outlandish, absurd, and pop. Preposterous. And he said the second coming was imminent and he told the family to protect the king, Wesson, at all costs. He told the children there were enemies all around them and laid out plans for what to do if the police or CPS came in to try to break up the family, saying it was only a matter of time in which the strongest soldier would have to execute each child and then turn the gun on themselves. He said any family member not at home at the time would be tracked down and executed prior to the soldier's suicide. That's so intense. I don't even know what to make of it. So by March of 2004, the family, capital V family, who had been living in a 1,000 square foot building, which had been a former law office, were told they had to vacate their home, which was zoned for commercial use only, not residential. The quote unquote home contained a myriad of objects which Wesson had collected, including antiques, battlefield relics, replica cannons, and 12 coffins. 12 wow. coffins. 12 coffins. Okay. It's so 12. Weird. It is. And uh, <laughs> he bought them on layaway with the money that his daughters and, and sons earned from working their jobs. So Jeez. it is. Uh, Dad, why are you buying that? I mean, I don't. <laughs> I, I, we are hungry. We are eating in trash cans. Yeah. Could we maybe get not something else? But again, coffins. you not. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know if you've ever bought a coffin, but they are at least ten thousand dollars. Yeah, my understanding is he got these on sale. They were like four hundred dollars a piece. Okay, well, and still not why, cheap. I, I, yeah, not cheap. No, <laughs> still not and cheap. I guess that's why he bought them because they were they were. On it sale. was a steal <laughs> he couldn't oh, resist he couldn't resist a deal <laughs> that's all of them dollars and i'll buy a hundred <laughs> that's 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 how my black ass dad would have looked at it i mean my dad was he couldn't resist a sale uh so uh i can't resist a bath and body works sale. can't resist exactly Not is, is it on sale i'll buy a thousand <laughs> How many coffee makers could one person use? I don't know, but they're on sale. <laughs> so it, it's it's ridiculous. I'm sorry. It is. <laughs> so anyway, um, they were getting kicked out of their house and they had a week to make other living arrangements. Okay. Wesson saw the walls closing in on him and his family secrets at risk of being exposed and tarnishing the clan he built. He bought a used school bus and fixed it up to use for transporting his family. The pimped out bus was equipped with the lids of coffins as seating. Scrap wood from the coffins was used as cabinets. And oh yeah, a hot tub. What? (laughs) What the fuck? (laughs) Miss Frizzle would be appalled. (laughs) This is not a magical school bus. It's a school bus of terror. Yes, the terrible school bus. (laughs) A terrible school bus with a hot tub. A terror tub. (laughs) Terra Tub With bus. A hot tub. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh my. Oh my god. Oh my god. And you know what's unfortunate is that what, you don't really have to say you know what happened in the beginning, like in the stats. He's not dead yet. And no. I, I just want him to be like inhale dead, under like, the yeah. jail, like, and he's. Oh god. He's not. Yeah. yeah. 
So uh, he planned on driving his pimped out bus with his family. <laughs> An exhibit was going to be there. Uh, pimp my ride. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I can't. We have to laugh to keep her crying because this is yeah, a, this this is is a really awful story. So he planned on driving his pimped out bus with his family in it to the Pacific Northwest where his parents lived, who he was still in contact with. So Wesson was told by law enforcement and authorities that it was illegal to operate the bus while it was still yellow and have it parked outside of the residence. So um, he decided to paint it black. And authorities should have known that there were children with him in this these questionable living conditions. But uh, they didn't. And Wesson had become increasingly paranoid. Um, so things are ramping up. Yeah. Wesson's niece, Ruby, who'd run away years earlier, and Sophina, who Wesson had kicked out, now had places of their own. They decided to take custody of their kids, Sophina's son, Jonathan, and Aviv, who was Ruby's son, both seven years old. I just um, wanted to point out how that these young women being in the world and they became empowered with distance from Wesson. And yeah. I think it's remarkable. Yeah. Um, even though it is tragic, I just think it's remarkable. So on March 12th, uh, 2004, Ruby and Safina convinced Elizabeth to join them for a barbecue, a BBQ, to avoid alerting Wesson of their plan. They then said that they had to go to the store for food supplies and left Elizabeth with her nephew's girlfriend, Yvette. But instead of going to the store, the girls snuck off to the Wesson home to collect their children. The girls knew that they had to take the chance to get their seven-year-old sons out now. Otherwise, they might never see their kids again after Wesson took the family away in the bus. They also knew that Wesson kept a gun in the house, but they were reluctant to get the police involved. Because of what Wesson told them and also... Yep. You know, black people don't fuck with the police. People yeah. normally die when they get involved. And I think he also uh, scared them a lot yep. about the police. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So Elizabeth found out that Ruby and Safina were not, in fact, at the store and had gone to the home on Hammond Drive to try to get their children. She panicked knowing how volatile the situation could become and rushed home. Another nephew's girlfriend named Mary called the police at 2.13 p.m. to report a domestic disturbance. And when the police didn't show up, she called again at 2.23 p.m. There were a total of five calls made to 911 by the family. During those calls, dispatch was advised that there was at least one gun in the home. The police didn't take the call seriously. Surprise, surprise. They thought Mary was overreacting. The CHP dispatcher commented to the police dispatcher, quote, We have transferred these out-of-control people on 761 West Hammond. I don't know how many times. Every time they call, the story gets more embellished, unquote. The other dispatcher laughed. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, oh my geez. God. And on the line with Mary, the dispatcher asked, nobody's heard or anything like that, right? And Mary replied, not yet. Officer Nelson was the first officer to arrive at the scene and was told there was a domestic disturbance between two mothers. It is unclear if he was aware of the report of a gun. Officer Nelson listened to Ruby, Sophina, and Wesson and concluded this was a custody dispute. He told them that no one would get hurt. Well, he was wrong. Yeah. So he brought his supervisor, Sergeant Patrick Jackson. Sergeant Jackson contacted Child Protective Services. Suddenly, Wesson was face to face with his worst nightmare and what he had warned his flock about. And they were all aware of this. Yes, they were. Wesson was blocking the doorway of the home with Kiani and Sabrina behind him. Many of the family were out in the yard arguing with each other. Elizabeth was furious with Ruby and Sophina, who she felt started this whole thing that she was terrified would turn into something horrendous, given Wesson's paranoia and the addition of the police. Ruby and Safina told the police to keep an eye on Wesson, Ruby adding that she didn't trust him. One of the officers told her that it was her who made a big mistake Eight years prior. Oh, when she was a child. Victim blaming much. Yeah. Um, victim blaming her for her connection to Wesson and for the current situation they found themselves in. That's horrible. Uh, awful. Disgusting. Yeah. I hope <laughs> I hope I hope, I hope there's, he feels a, horrible. there's a great yeah. place in hell for that that officer. Yeah. During the chaos, attention was diverted away from Wesson, who slipped back into the house around 3.30 p.m. Ruby panicked when she noticed Wesson was no longer outside of the building. The family outside begged police to stop Wesson before he killed the children. About an hour and a half after Ruby and Safina called the police, Elizabeth entered the home herself 
to find out what was going on. Apparently because it was what police considered just a domestic dispute and they allowed it. They weren't really securing the scene or or trying doing much to try to figure out what was going on inside the home. They were just yeah, trying to solve it's the just dispute nuts. outside. Yeah. yeah. When she entered, the home was unusually quiet, too quiet. She went to the dimly lit back bedroom and she saw Wesson kneeling on the floor with Lisi in what looked like prayer. When Lisi turned to look at her, she could see Lisi's eyes were swollen with tears that were running down her face. Wesson beckoned for Elizabeth to join them, but instead she turned and ran. To this day, she doesn't know why she ran, but she did, yelling and screaming out of the house. Wesson then barricaded himself inside the bedroom. At 3.46 p.m., officers dispatched a SWAT team to the scene. So now we're going to get into the investigation and the arrest. What do you got, Beth? What happened next is a bit murky. None of the officers on the scene reported hearing any gunshots. The standoff lasted a little over an hour before the SWAT team surrounded the home and Wesson emerged from the house with his hands in the air, his clothes soaked in blood. He did not resist arrest and officers escorted him away from the home. The grief outside of the home by the surviving family members was palpable. Officers entering the home were unprepared for the carnage they saw. Officer Eloy Escarreno thought the children were hiding, but when he saw the pile of bodies, he was unable to proceed with the investigation and had to be escorted out by another officer. At 4.57 p.m., paramedics arrived. When they came out, they confirmed the family's worst fears. All of the children were dead. Officers were unable to identify all of the victims until a few days after the incident. In all, nine of the women and children who had been in the home lay on top of each other. 25-year-old Sabrina, 17-year-old Lissy, 8-year-old Illy Bell, 7-year-old Aviv, 7-year-old Jonathan, 4-year-old Ethan, 2-year-olds Marche and Sedona, and 1-year-old Jeva. All of the victims were shot through the eye with a Ruger 22 caliber semi-automatic rifle. Local funeral homes offered to provide services pro bono. The children were laid to rest at two different funerals. Elizabeth was still angry with Ruby and Sophia, blaming them for what happened, so they organized a separate funeral for Jonathan and Aviv. Elizabeth handled arrangements for the other seven children. Both funerals were held on March 24th. In the months after the killings, Elizabeth and her children expressed their support for Wesson. Several of Wesson's children, surviving sons, rose to his defense, telling reporters that Wesson was a wonderful father who loved his children and never could have hurt them. Slowly, though, time and distance brought awareness and grief. In 2010, Wesson's sons Adrian, Serafino, and Dorian said that only years after the crime could they see their father for what he was, psychotic, delusional, and narcissistic. So now we are going to get into the trial. Wesson tried to decline a public defender, but he couldn't represent himself or afford a private attorney, so a public defender was appointed to him anyway. He had no intention of pleading insanity, which I think is why he declined, because he, he didn't want to uh, do that. So two weeks after the mass killing of his children, he pleaded not guilty to nine counts of murder and 33 counts of sexual abuse. One year later, jury selection began for his trial. 500 citizens of Fresno were summoned for jury service. A change of venue was requested by Wesson's attorney, given the media attention on the case and the prejudice within the jury pool. But the court denied the request. The prosecution only had circumstantial evidence to link Wesson to the murders. There was no DNA, witnesses, or fingerprint to suggest that he pulled the trigger. The prosecution planned to show that he was guilty of orchestrating the deaths. The defense tried to insert as much reasonable doubt as they could. They blamed Sabrina, painting her as a gun enthusiast. They noted that her DNA was on the gun and she died after all the other children. Wesson never took the stand at trial in his defense, which is common. And during the trial, he played music on an imaginary keyboard and scribbled <laughs> chicken scratch on a yellow legal pad. 
<laughs> wow. Sophina described the lengths of abuse she endured and what she had to do to leave. She showed the jury the scar on her chest from when Wesson stabbed her. Mm. Elizabeth testified about when she entered the bedroom and her daughter Lisi turned her head and looked at her while crying. Mm. She didn't say a word to her mother as if she had accepted her fate. The prosecution played audio recordings from the siege, put numerous witnesses on the stand, used visual aids, which included a diagram of the family tree showing that Wesson incestuously fathered numerous children, including the nine victims. DNA testing provided proof that Wesson had fathered the children. They presented bloody crime scene photos showing each victim fatally shot in the eye at close range and photos of his young pregnant nieces and daughters. They didn't hold back and ultimately convinced the jury that years of abuse by him led to the murder of the children, whether he pulled the trigger or not. Yes. Yeah. So the defense didn't deny the incest, nor did they try to explain it away. They admitted Wesson fathered all of the deceased children. They basically said that incest was bad, but come on, guys. Mm. Incest and family dysfunction doesn't mean murder. Am I right? Mm. And therefore, they asked the jury to return a verdict of not guilty. The trial lasted three months. Ultimately, the jury decided that even if he didn't pull the trigger, he instructed his strongest soldier to do the murders and found him guilty of first degree murder. One week after that, the jury handed down the penalty of death on all nine counts. All right. So now let's get into where are they now? Well, I'll tell you. Wesson was sent to death row at San Quentin Prison in the Bay Area in California. And I wonder why we haven't heard from him on Ear Hustle. Oh, I'm just curious. Yes. He was on death row and not in Gen Pop. So I don't oh, know. Okay. I don't but know I, if they could talk to him. Oh, well, that makes sense. Okay, never mind. Um, But before he was sent there, there were claims that he spent most of his time in jail masturbating Ugh. and smearing his semen on uh, his box. Gross. Yeah, it's disgusting. I'm sorry, but we had to tell you this part of the story. Um, And so when he was sent to prison, locks are forbidden on death row. So they were cut off. Today, the survivors of the Wesson family are thriving, according to Alicia Sofios, the journalist who helped them in the wake of the massacre. Ethically, Alicia was in a quandary. As a journalist, she was supposed to stay detached and not get involved. But thankfully, she chose humanity and did become involved. Elizabeth and her daughters found themselves without a home and for one reason or another were not admitted to shelters in the area. Some simply chose not to admit them because they did not want the notoriety. Ugh, that's awful. I know. Alicia let the family stay with her at first for what was supposed to be a few days, but then it turned into seven years. For this decision, Alicia paid a price with her career. She was relegated to fluff pieces for the next 10 years, but she doesn't regret it and considers the family her family. Yeah. Again, when we met her at CrimeCon, I had never heard of this story, but she was just really, um, I was amazed i was blown she, away I, was, yeah. I couldn't believe it like she was like yeah they stayed in my house she talked about christmas she talked about she was like i had this teeny tiny place and it was just like wow this is like wow oh my god she just they were it's so amazing. lucky it was amazing yeah. they were yeah. so lucky and she and uh, we we She's can't make her now. yeah she yeah. does have a big heart now, i don't know if if we would have covered the story in the way that I feel like we have, if we, if hadn't, we hadn't talked, talked to, her. to her. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So Rosa and her boyfriend had a baby girl in 2009. She earned her GED and was studying to be a nurse. She also rescues and cares for stray animals. Kiani is a fitness model and works the runways and can be seen in print ads. She also works at a pharmacy in Santa Cruz where she lives with her boyfriend and their daughter. Gypsy attended college in Fresno and planned to graduate with a business degree. She had a little girl that she named Alicia. That is really, really beautiful. Really sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Dorian lived in Santa Cruz and studied martial arts, but he died in 2013 after losing a battle with cancer. Mm. Marcus Jr. earned his GED and became a firefighter. Serafino married and had two sons and a daughter with hopes of becoming a police officer. Sophia and Ruby worked to reintegrate back into the family, and the two split factions worked towards forgiveness. Elizabeth continues to encourage her children to establish close sibling relationships. She no longer blames her nieces Ruby and Sophia for the murders and apologized to them. In May 
May of 2010, Elizabeth was legally divorced from Marcus and began attending college. The Wessons house was torn down as a community service in July of 2006. The entire family continues to work towards healing through therapy, and many of the surviving family members changed their last names. And I think Gypsy changed her first name as well. Um, And I was going to say, I don't know if we've seen that before with other cases where yeah. the entire scene is destroyed um, on behalf of the community. I just thought that was really interesting for them to yeah. tear down the whole place. So now it's time for our takeaways. What do you think made Wesson snap, Beth? And what are your thoughts on this case? Well, it's not lost on me how Wesson broke every single rule that the Seventh-day oh Adventists set God, out. This <laughs> motherfucker. Oh, my it's God. Like he, he made a list and <laughs> broke them all. Do- all, all of the things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you're absolutely right. His mom was a religious fanatic, and uh-huh. I think that fucked him up, um, as uh, well as his dad's behavior. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really understand his desire to control everyone and everything. Um, okay. I don't, I don't get that. I don't have that Wait at a minute. All. <laughs> but you're a perfectionist. And yeah, my impression but- of, I don't, I'm, I don't know. I don't know the perfectionist life. I just witness it. And my impression <laughs> is they want to control everything. And so is am I wrong on that? I don't know. Well, I, I want I want to control <laughs> things when it comes to like stuff I'm working on. Uh-huh. But I have no desire to control people. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that because yeah. I, I didn't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not, a- not a control freak. I'm I I want the things that I do to be perfect. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you for clarifying. But I'm sorry. Not everything. Yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> I'm, I'm, totally. I'm like a um a selective uh perfectionist. <laughs> like cleaning okay. the house and doing the dishes and stuff. I don't give a shit about that. But uh-huh. um, if I'm working on an art project or yeah. um, or a PowerPoint. Po- Oh or my god. Yes, or <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Yes. You know, I don't know why I was thinking about this today, but there have been times where you weren't able like in the past, you weren't uh-huh. able to edit episodes and I was uh-huh. like, "Oh, I'll do it." <laughs> and then <laughs> and then I did it and you were like, "Um, can I can I do it <laughs> instead of you for like forever?" <laughs> I was like, well, I thought I did it. I thought I did okay, but okay. <laughs> um, I so... do apologize. <laughs> you don't have to apologize. I appre- I love you and appreciate you for the person that you are to me. I don't, I'm not perfect. And I, I mean, everything I do isn't perfect, but I, that's what I strive for. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I guess I'm learning that there's a distinction between perfectionism and controlling. Yes. Yes. And I didn't, I didn't realize that I guess didn't until t- yeah. I was today years old. Today. <laughs> that, so thank you. <laughs> so he wanted to control everything. Yes. And that seems to be what drove him yeah. and that and, and using people for whatever selfish thing that he wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a pig and one sick fuck. Yeah. I, uh, ugh, yes. Gross. Yes. Disgusting. Yeah. Disgusting. And I think that he started to feel like he was losing control. Several of the women had left Uh and the family was getting kicked out of their house Uh around the same time. Oh, and there's the whole bus issue with the Mm -hmm. police saying that he couldn't have it or whatever they were saying, but I had a hot tub. (laughs) Yeah. Hot tub time machine. Here we come. (laughs) And then around the same time, he started getting more paranoid and fanatical. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. Why he killed the kids. I don't, I don't really understand that. I don't understand. And he's never said anything about it. He's never told why he it did is, it. It is weird that he, I mean, for being such a narcissist that yeah. and, and such a controlling person that he hasn't done one interview. Um, yeah. And by the way, the because uh, I'm in Atlanta, they're um, talking about the um, Atlanta child murders case on the news a lot lately because oh. the family members are like, what are we going to do about these kids who's nobody nobody's answered for? Anyway, but about Wesson. 
And I will say that in this is a culture corner in the black community, there are certain avenues to get out of poverty and get out of the situation that you're in. You could be a basketball player. You could be a famous singer, performer or dancer, or you can be a preacher. Um. There's a lot of money in preaching. And you can have your own church, you can do whatever you want, you can be the boss, and you can be this controlling person. There's also this, um, the, the Black church plays a big part in Black people's survival in general, in, in yeah. just the spiritual aspect of the fact that this sucks, but there's some guy upstairs who's looking out for me and everything's going to be okay at some point. And right. um, that message is really infectious and a lot of people cling to it. And I think Wesson might have as a young man, this is all speculation, but taken that idea of I can be a preacher, maybe not for a big congregation or a mega church. I can't, I'm not going to be Joel Olstein, but I can be a Joel Olstein in my own house. Yeah. And, yeah. and so that's the vibe that I was getting. Also, infanticide and familicide are interesting topics when you consider Black American history. I just watched a um, documentary with Toni Morrison and you might, you know, the book beloved oh, yeah. about the woman who killed her, un her child who was the product of rape and she killed the child to save them from enslavement. Mm. And his childhood, I think absolutely played a part in his awful behavior. Um, but I also think that the, uh, the idea of uh, authorities and the outside world coming in to destroy what we have built here, which is quote unquote, so amazing and beautiful is um, what I think contributed to him thinking that it was okay to do this suicide homicide pact and for the family buying into it is like, um, I don't know. I feel, I, I feel like I've lost my train of thought, but um, <laughs> it made me think of the book beloved um, right. just this killing my infant um, or my children to protect them, save and, them from something yeah, else, to save them from something worse in the world. And then um, Elizabeth to some might be seen as a responsible party. Elizabeth is the mother of a lot of right. these children. And I think we have to remember and give Elizabeth grace because she was victimized from the beginning. She, this all yeah. started when she was eight years old. Yeah. And she didn't have much in the way she of was formal education. Yeah, she was. And so I... You know, you might think, how could a mother like let all this happen? But she was kept she didn't know it, in a know really, any yeah, yeah, my naive and uninformed position. And so I think, it, and it's not her fault. It's Wesson's fault that yeah. all this happened. So I, yeah, I, he I just, did these things to all these, all these people. Yes. I mean, and, it, it, when you think about the scope, mm -hmm. uh, the effect that he had, the magnitude, uh, yeah, yes. it's huge. It's huge. Yeah. And so I just, I, I know that a lot of people might want to want to blame Elizabeth, and I don't think that it's fair because yeah. of how young she was when I agree. she was indoctrinated. I guess is, right. is the thing. Yeah. Um, and then um, Wesson was a manipulative individual like he convinced the police not to go in and investigate what the fuck was going on in that house and convince cps ah, my kid's fine blah 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 but um i think that one thing to consider i've read um a book called adult children of alcoholics and one thing that you learn when your parent is an unpredictable person yeah. is how to manipulate and sort of avoid conflict and get people to do what you want so you can hmm. be safe. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes, I and do. And so I feel like Marcus, because of his father being such an abusive individual who was an, an also an alcoholic, I think contributed to his ability to be able to manipulate people to do what he wanted. Yeah, he learned. Um, he, learned he learned how to, how to do that as a child. Yeah. yeah to be you do it you, as a child to be safe but as an adult you do it to maintain power safety i don't know exactly whatever, what yeah. it is but whatever it is that led wesson to do that i think that contributed so yeah i'm done oh my god <laughs> what a tough case i'm so glad i'm yeah, so glad, I'm glad we, it's over <laughs> we did it okay we did it we've been putting this off for so long a and long we did time it. yeah so now it's time to talk about how not to get murdered if you love true crime and you don't want to die here's a tip for you <laughs> 
This segment is not intended to be victim blaming. We thought of this segment because I read somewhere that a lot of people listen to true crime because they want to know what they can do to be safer. This is not meant to blame the victims. It's just learning from other people's experiences. Sometimes we have no suggestions for a particular episode and we'll just offer up generic tips. This case is giving domestic abuse a lot of it. So we just yeah. wanted to shout out if you are experiencing domestic violence or you know somebody who is, give them this number. Call this number yourself, the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233 or go to the hotline.org. All calls are toll free and confidential. And the hotline is available 24-7 and they offer help in more than 170 languages. So wow, that's amazing. Please share, 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 share. One more time, the number is 1-800-799-7233 and the website is thehotline.org. Um, now it is time to dive into the shout out portion of the show where we shout out any content by or about any othered or marginalized or minoritized folks or any true crime goodies. Um, I just have a few. Okay. I wanted to shout out We Are Here on HBO Max. It is three drag queens, Bob the Drag Queen, Shangela, and Eureka <laughs> go to small towns across the United States and they encourage and empower LGBTQ plus folks who are reluctant to be themselves and also people who are really proud to be themselves and allies to share their stories, have conversations and do drag and have some fun and just love. It's all that about love. Awesome. It's yeah. amazing. So check that out. And then also Believe Her podcast is a true crime podcast, but a little bit different. So it's a six episode series about a woman who was a victim of domestic violence and domestic abuse. And she, in self-defense, killed her offender, her partner. And this is a true story? It's a true story. And she's in prison. And it's it's um, first-hand accounts from her, her attorneys, journalists, um, newspaper writers, all the stuff to provide evidence, talk about the aftermath, talk about the, the ins and outs of the, of, the, of the case. And it just kind of shed some light on how women who are abused are criminalized. Yeah. And it's it's awful. And so that's what I wanted to um to say so what do you got subscribe it's real. it's 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 not that long um but it's really really bad blew me away what do you got uh well i've been watching three pines on amazon prime does it have anything to do with chris pine no nothing to do with chris pine oh okay (laughs) i know you're excited i know i love chris pine he's my favorite blue eyed guy named chris hello <laughs> Come but get this. No, Chris dialysis. Pine is not in it. Get in between these thighs, Chris. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so it's a, a show uh, starring Alfred Molina as a police inspector from Quebec. So it, it's Canadian. Oh. It's a mystery series, and there's a missing and murdered Indigenous women subplot. Oh, well, where do you get it? On oh, Amazon, Amazon Prime. Prime. Oh, there yep. it is. Duh. Okay. Well, it sounds. Where do you get it? I'm Give it to what? me. Give it what? to me. Like, is it in between these thighs? Okay. No. But Amazon Prime. That's fine. Um. So, so for the shout outs, we got HBO Max. We're here. Uh. We also have Believe Her wherever you get your podcasts, and Three Pines on Amazon Prime. No. Please. We're here again. Please. It's here. No. It's here. <laughs> why do we do this why do we do this to ourselves i quit i quit i can't do this anymore i can't keep i can't keep showing up for you and then you leave every time and then we just leave. The show. And i just leave later, you just leave all my life no. <laughs> I won't do that again. But uh, <laughs> where can people find us? Ben? Our website is fruitloopspod.com. Our Facebook page is Fruit Loops Pod. And our discussion group is Fruit Loops Pod Discussion on Facebook. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at Fruit Loops Pod. And links to our sources will be in our footnotes. So we also wanted to say we're going on a break after Christmas and we'll be back in February. In the meantime, don't worry. We'll still have something for you to listen to on Thursdays. All right. Beth and Wendy on a break. (laughs) (laughs) This is a weekly podcast, y'all. And new episodes drop every Thursday. Oh, good. So until next time. 
look alive, y'all. It's crazy out there. See y'all soon. <laughs> <laughs> A news story gets shared by a friend on social media, or you catch a tweet that really makes your blood boil. But how do you separate fact from fiction? That's the premise behind Disinformation, a 10-part series from Evergreen Podcasts and Emergent Risk International coming this fall. Tune in to Disinformation wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't believe everything you read.